Hi, this is Eric from longboxreview.com. Welcome to the show. Today I have three number one issues that I want to just chat about real quick. Uh, this is going to be, this isn't going to be anything in depth, uh, just uh, some first impressions of these new series. And those three series are uh, The Undiscovered Country from Image Comics, 20XX also from Image Comics, and Dragonfly and Dragonfly Man from Ahoy Comics. And I'll start with the, uh, uh, I shouldn't say the, it's just Undiscovered Country. I'll start with Undiscovered Country. And this is by, uh, written by Scott Snyder and Charles Soule, with art by Giuseppe Camacoli and Danielle or- Orlandini, uh, with coloring by Matt Wilson and lettering by Crank. So um, this is, uh, if you read the back matter, which I, I found interesting, I, I like it when the uh, the creators talk about why they do these things. Kind of makes it easy also for me as, as, as someone who likes to talk about comics to know a little bit about the, the, the background, the intentions, that kind of a thing. So basically, the, this opening issue is about uh, th- uh, 30 years after America has sealed itself off from the world. So this is some future timeline where this has happened. Uh, it, it kind of extrapolates a little bit uh, the sort of nationalist, uh, isolationist tendencies that seem to be resurging here in America, uh, unfortunately. But um, it, it, it's interesting that it... it, uh, it that the the writers and and the artists have taken that 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 idea and extrapolated what they did here. So, like I said, this is this is um, a team of what is it? Seven people, three men, and four women who are in a helicopter approaching uh, the coastline of California. That's how the book opens, and uh, they are uh, they've been invited by someone to come to the United States because or, or with with the promise of a cure for a pandemic virus called the sky virus but um so they're going there and also out of curiosity what has the United States been up to for the last 30 years and so um hijinks ensue as they say but uh, I'll get into some of that in a little bit and as they come up, come up on the on the California coastline, we see this uh, two page spread of uh, the helicopter hovering or approaching, I should say, the walled fortress of the U.S. I guess. I mean, it, it, they built. I don't know how how tall this wall is, but but really tall wall all along the coastline of California here, or at least that's the implication. And then they're attacked, and then we get a flashback for uh, one of the. Uh, one of the characters, Dr. Graves, she's an, uh, what was it, an epidemiologist, I think. Uh, and then there's some other characters as well that we find. Uh, one is, uh, I think he's a, uh, an ex-soldier or a, or a fighter of some kind. There's a pilot. One, one, of, the, one of the folks is recording things, so she, I assume she's a journalist. And then we get, then we get uh, the reason for the visit. So they get a message, a video message from a character called Sam Elgin. Uh, there's some delibera- deliberations from uh, from the people who are from a cross-section of governments uh, and, and their representatives. And so there's a pan-Asian represent, uh, set, a couple of representatives. I think that takes care of everyone on on the main cast here. Anyway, so I, like I said, uh, the they were they were attacked. A, a missile was shot at them. It shoots down their helicopter, and they land. And they're they're trying to find their way to. Well, they're trying to find some way to uh, contact people, and they're deliberating whether or not to continue with the mission. But they kind of have no choice, and that's when the welcoming party arrives, and we get this two page spread of what looks like a scene out of a Mad Max scenario um, with some weird-looking creatures. (laughs) So here's all these vehicles. There's no more gas, so they're being pulled by these mutant animals. Uh, One looks to be a shark. Another is some sort of giant fish. There's this snake-like thing. I see uh, some turtle-looking things. 
uh, a scorpion type thing, uh, some creature on this big pinkish creature on two legs pulling an RV. Uh, it's, it's, oh, and, and then, um, the leader of the group comes up to the pilot who got hurt and, and was left behind while the others went out exploring, uh, cause his, his leg is broken, I think, or something like that. And there, this guy comes up, uh, they're all dressed in, they look like mummies. Uh, all these, all these creatures, uh, these people, I guess, I don't know if they're creatures, um, but they're all, <laughs> there's something because, um, like I said, they're all, uh, wrapped in uh, strips of strips of cloth and his arms are way too long for your average human. So there's some genetic changes here, but he's riding on this, what looks like a bison, a very aggressive bison. Anyway, the, the rest of the band, uh, they, they're trying to hide, uh, but they're, they're being pursued by these, these creatures on, looks like on two sides. They co- they come across the crest of a hill, and there there's other people in this big, giant, uh, sort of like a roving city, uh, coming up on them as well. And then this mysterious creature, or <laughs> creature, this this guy in a mask, uh, wearing a United States flag on his chest, shows up and says, "Follow me if you want to live." Basically, anyway, he takes him into his cave. Uh, tells them about, I know, well, well, he gives them a little background. The, 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 the person the, the I guess the quote unquote bad guy of this is referred to as the destiny man. And, uh, he's, he's the one that's coming after them and trying to find this guy in the mask. And then we see this, uh, map here of the United States. So we get our first glimpse of kind of how the United States is, mm, uh, made up these days and uh <laughs> it's it's interesting um in the i'll start in the pacific northwest area uh because that's that's where i'm from so it's called the code lands in the i'll say the montana area sort of east of the pacific northwest the new people purple mountain kingdom uh you're talking about the central north part of america uh, then we get closer to the Great Lakes area, and um, it's called the Tempest or Tossed, Tempest Tossed. I assume that has that's supposed to be something to do with tornadoes, I guess, but that's not in the right place. But you know, global warming and all that. Uh, the uh, the Great Lakes are area is even bigger than <laughs> than it's supposed to be. It's called the Shining Sea. The the tip of the the northeastern tip of America doesn't quite look right, so it looks like maybe we've annexed part of Canada, or or the the map is just drawn weirdly. Going down the eastern seaboard, you know, north of Florida, it's called just called Knox with a bunch of uh, dollar signs in parentheses, and then we get down to Texas, it's called the Red Glare question mark question mark question mark, and then finally where. Uh, I guess where they're going to start their journey because, uh, well, it's called destiny, but the, the way the map is besides showing us the areas, oh, and there's some areas that are, uh, colored Brown and they got some skulls, uh, on them. And, and so California is, and, um, that area is, is that, and, and including part, uh, parts of the Pacific Northwest as well. Uh, so the, western tip of washington a bit of idaho at the top so hopefully they you know hopefully I'm, I'm in the code lands and not in that that no man's land i guess certain parts of the the south uh south part of texas and uh new mexico i'm getting my my uh geography mixed up in my head for america it shows how dumb i am um and then like i said that that northeastern tip of america is also brown but no curiously no no skull there Oh, and I forgot to mention, uh, the Shining Sea area has has a sea monster <laughs> drawn on it. That's funny. Anyway, uh, like I said, Destiny. Uh, well, th- this 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 gentleman who's who's rescued them and is saying, you know, you need to go on a journey. There's a prophecy, he says, and uh, they're they're there to help 
Save America. And this person is Sam Elgin. And uh, he, at the, the, the very last page, he it's a splash page, revealing himself. And uh, he's pointing at them. He's got, like I say, he's got that American flag on his chest. He's kind of got this uh, vest buttoned up. Uh, the way he looks, white hair, kind of gaunt features. Uh, he's got he's got that white goatee. And uh, he lo- he's pointing directly at us. And, you know, he's he's evoking Uncle Sam. He he's talking about. Uh, he says here, "This is where we'll make the the plan. This is where the spiral walk will begin, all the way to the heartland, and that's what the map shows." So, uh, in the southwestern part of the states, the destiny part, that's where they begin, and and they have this red, white, and blue path that spirals around America to all these various places that I just mentioned until you get to the heartland of America, and that's where that sets up. You know the the uh, the hero's journey of the story. Uh, as far as a first issue introduction, um, I mean, it sets up quite a, an interesting story that uh, I'm I'm intrigued by. Uh, I have a lot of questions, and not all of them are like, "Ooh, wow, this is really cool." This is like, "Why is it like this?" type of thing, you know. How far in the future is this? That doesn't really matter to me. Uh, but they have force field technology. The air wall is what they called it, which has kept everybody out. Besides the the walls, the the, the fortified walls with weapons um, that were built a- around America. There's also this force field wall, so people can't you know come in from the sky. So uh, you know things happened. Uh, in fact, there's 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 a little bit more of a history in the back here. They got a timeline. I'll talk about in a second. But well, heck, I'll just talk about it now. So they they call the, you know, 30 years ago, when America cut itself off from the world, they call it the ceiling. Well, eight years before that, part of the reason this started was that uh, in retaliation for an endless series of escalating tariffs and trade wars that crossed multiple administrations, China called in its outstanding U.S. currency debt, causing an immediate devaluation of the dollar inflation uh, and and a brutal global recession whose effects were disproportionately felt uh, felt inside the U.S., that's interesting. I, I read that as outside <laughs> when I first read it. Anyway, uh, then they, they talk about the air wall force field technology. Uh, shortly after that, there's a there's a power grid failure in February uh, that's referred to as, as a, that lasted for over three weeks. That was referred to as the smoke out due to much of the population using all available sources of fuel for fires to remain warm. And then something called Pro- seven years before the ceiling something called project aurora aurora begins uh, outside of leadville colorado and so you know so like i said this is this is set 30 years after the ceiling and then you get when we see the 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 stuff uh the that two page spread that i described with with the vehicles and the creatures i'm like 30 years and we have mutant animals pulling cars around does that seem right and then the way the u.s i you know uh, given an economic collapse um i mean we 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 kind of see this in lazarus where the government basically doesn't exist anymore the social norms are no longer existing and what happened was in lazarus is that certain rich families took over and then divided up uh the real estate so to speak so that seems a lot more plausible to me than suddenly having 30 years later um, mutant creatures. But, you know, who knows what sort of advances <laughs> occurred in 30 years to adjust for an isolationist country who ran out of fuel and other resources that they would then develop. So I, I guess uh, it just seem, seems like too much of a leap for me. The characters are interesting. Um, well, I should, I should, I should rephrase that. The characters are interesting in what little backstory that we get. We get that first one with the epidemiologist. Uh, I think, you know, because you know, setting her up as our point of view character, I suppose. Um, I think in the second issue, which I have read, uh, we get a little bit more of the backstory of one or two of the other characters. So we'll get that revealed throughout time. But man, there's a lot of dialogue in here, <laughs> uh, which doesn't surprise me. It's a it's a it's a in part written by Scott Snyder. He tends to be a little wordy, 
Um, in fact, I was I was looking through this, thinking of a particular scene in which uh, I remembered a lot of dialogue boxes, or yeah, a lot of dialogue going on here. Yeah, here it is. There, there it's the scene in this looks like an an official room of some sort, and um, uh, they're just around this table being briefed on the situation. And there, so one panel is spanning the two pages, and then we get three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there's like eleven or twelve panels on this page, and lots of talking heads, lots of words. I think in issue two, there's even there's there's another similar scene that's constructed that is even more words on a, on the pages. I'm like, this is this is dense in terms of the the amount of words on a page. I don't know that we need all that. Uh, I know I shouldn't complain about, you know, getting dialogue and 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 I guess world building through the dialogue. But anyway, the the common Coley and um, uh, Orlandini and Wilson art uh, is fine. Uh, common Coley is not not always, hasn't always been my favorite artist, but uh, does a, a fine job. Uh, you know, it's sufficiently alien looking with all the creatures and stuff. But you know, it's nothing, nothing really different about this. I do appreciate though that the the main characters all have a different look, so they're easily distinguishable, and that's not always the case. I remember reading The Walking Dead and not always knowing which character I was reading at that moment because they all kind of look similar. But I do really—I should have started with this—but I do really like the the main cover of this, which is just showing uh, a map of North America kind of a, a relief type map of North America and the United States is whited out from the rest of, you know, from Canada and, and Mexico. And then, uh, finally, um, there's, there's uh, a few pages here written by Scott Snyder giving us the origin of the series. And this, while he and Charles soul kind of wanted to work on something since I think 2012, they really hit on the idea for this book, this this particular approach in 2017. So it's been a few years in development, and I found I found uh, I found this almost more interesting than the actual story in the comic. But you know, it's a first issue. We shall see. Uh, you get plenty of you got plenty of pages here. I don't know how many it is, but it's certainly more than your typical DC and Marvel book. And I'll just you know complain about the paper at DC and Marvel, at least the image book, this image book at least. And it's not the same for the other image book. I just, I just, uh, I'll point out, but you know, the nice thicker stock for the cover and the, the interior page is also nice and durable. I like that. I wish all comics were like this. Anyway, um, if, you know, future geopolitical thrillers, uh, um, <laughs> celebrating the spirit of America, I guess, <laughs> sounds interesting to you, then Undiscovered Country is a comic for you. All right. So next I'll talk about 20XX from Image Comics. Like I said, uh, this is by Jonathan Luna and Lauren Keeley. So Luna does, as it says here, story, story is our script assists, illustrations, lettering, and design with Lauren Keeley doing story and script. Uh, it should be noted that this is Jonathan Luna's, uh, says here, first black and white comic, uh, which I honestly didn't realize. See, I, I, I picked this up. This was a, this was, I didn't even have to think about it really because I, I loved Luna's Alex and Ada comic from a few years back. And I listened to an interview with, I think, David Harper with Jonathan Luna, uh, uh, talking about this book. Anyway, uh, it got me excited for it. The cover of this book shows two women. So you get that kind of that dual character aspect of, of Alex and Ada here. Uh, one of whom has an artificial arm. The other has blood coming out of her eyes and she's holding this, um, this mask to cover her mouth and nose that she's kind of pulled down. But, uh, and then there's there's papers flying all around them. A very simple color uh, cover it doesn't really tell me anything about the, about the book, um, other than you know some weird stuff. 
Uh, this also is set in the near future, hence the 20XX. Um, so uh, Jonathan Luna, while approaching a different a different story, still a futuristic type story, because Alex and Ada was also set in the you know near future of, uh, at that time. So uh, in this one, however, interestingly, interestingly enough, this there's also a a sort of pandemic going around. There's a virus. So uh, in undiscovered country is the sky virus, and uh, it. It uh, it was it was basically it would kill you. Uh, it was just a matter of time, and then when you died, all this uh, I forgot to mention this, uh, but it <laughs> this kind of bluish fluid came out of your orifices. Uh, they showed one character whose face was just whose face was bleeding out this blue blue stuff. Now that's not the case here. Uh, this one is called the Bethel virus, and uh, it has a one percent chance of survival. And those who do survive it, and our main character, Maria, is is uh, just got some good news. Uh, she's she's got uh, she's going to be promoted at work. She works for some, I guess, uh, a book publisher magazine. She's going to be uh, an editor, and uh, she's very excited about it. This is where uh, we we are, first of all, this is where we are shown the kind of like the futuristic setting. Because this is this is Anchorage, Anchorage, Alaska. Anyway, so we find out that also that people have, I guess, implants. Uh, this is something that Luna did also in Alex and Ada. So she has some sort of implant, a communications implant. So like think of think of having a cell phone in your head, and so that's how she communicates. It's by thought. Um, but then she goes to work to discuss the uh the promotion she's gotten and that's where you see the mask the face mask they cover their nose and their mouth and that's to protect them help protect them from the bethel virus she's talking to a co-worker and then uh the co-worker sees on mare's face that she's bleeding from her eyes which means she's con- she's contracted the virus she survives spoilers um <laughs> she survived and what happens is that the survivors of the bethel virus end up manifesting um, t- uh, selective telekinesis and sensing. So, you know, kind of like ESP type stuff. Uh, and she's told it may take up to two weeks for her abilities to manifest. And then she has to be, she has to report this to the Department of, Id- of Identi- Identification, whatever that is. Uh, and then how to take a brief training course and how to avoid accidental use of SDS. So it's outlawed. Um, she then finds that she doesn't have a job because they thought she was going to die. Uh, she decides to try and find her cousin. I'm not, I can't remember why now. Oh, I think, oh, cause he has, he, he, he had the virus too and survived. So she goes to this. So there's a couple of different, she goes to this bar where that is, is where the, the, some survivors go to, uh, that she knew about. And uh, she gets to the bar, and there's some graffiti on here. For, well, first of all, there's there's a sign that says "Sims Welcome," and then some some assholes have have spray painted on here. No, you're not. On the doors, effing stassers, worm brains, leave. You know that kind of crap. So, like I said, she's she's looking for her cousin. She ends up meeting. The uh, the other character that's shown on the cover, I don't believe her name is is given here. Anyway, she takes her to uh, another room uh, adjacent to the bar, and it's uh, it's where the Sims are using their abilities in in private. Well, you know, in a, in a room full of other Sims, but you know, it's it's not in public. And uh, Mare is amazed. Uh, the other woman asks her uh has 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 your abilities manifested yet and she said no she says close your eyes just concentrate on being receptive it manifests sooner than most people think so not within that two-week period so she closes her eyes and then in the darkness she senses her companion and can see not only sense her her bodily presence but she can see the insides of her so we see so her intestines her lungs her heart, that kind of stuff. And so she, she's asked, what did you see? And she's like, you, 
<laughs> anyway, she leaves and then proceeds to track down her cousin at this place. Uh, and he runs out of the back of this establishment and he's being pursued by... Uh, so he he uh, apparently was part of a gang of Sims and is considered a traitor by them. And now he's part of another gang and they, the first gang is after him. They're trying to kill him. So uh, he's being pursued by these two people in masks, full full face masks. Anyway, so this is where we get to see the the telekinetic battle that was hinted at at the very first, uh, the very first page. Yeah, the very first page of the of the comic. And uh, Mare is attacked by one of those folks, and then her abilities manifest in a very big way, and that's how the issue ends. And I won't spoil exactly what that is because it is quite a quite a interesting reveal, I guess, which I guess sets up what's going to come. So, uh, very interesting that both these new issues, I didn't even kind of realize it until I was getting ready to record how they both got these pandemic viruses um, that can that basically kills everyone, uh, near future situations. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Uh, interesting. The, the, uh, the zeitgeist in, in comic books right now, but, uh, I, I quite enjoyed it. Um, like I said, I, I was a big fan of Alex and Ada. Uh, I, this is still too new. I haven't read issue two yet. I haven't received issue two yet. Um, so I'm not sure where this is going. Uh, but, from just what I've read, though, I, I you know I'm intrigued enough. The, the main character, Mare, is uh, likable enough. Uh, you f- you feel for her. She feels isolated and alone and uh, scared, and you get that. And then you know stuff ramps up from there. Luna's art is is uh, you know good as always. Uh, he, he has a very simple style, um, which is accentuated by the black and white quality of the book um so you don't get that that depth that color artists bring to to comic books a lot of the time but it doesn't feel flat or anything um you know the the gray tones and and use of black you know this is judiciously done uh just enough so you get some depth but i like it um he draws uh Again, uh, going back to what I said in Undiscovered Country, he he uh, draws distinctive faces, and that's what I really like. Uh, at the end of the book, there's a, a big thank you for picking this up to us. Um, it was in development for over a year. Uh, this is where I found out that this was his first, uh, Jonathan Luna's first series in black and white. And for Lauren Keeley, this is her first, her first time writing any series, it says. Yeah, I'm looking forward to what comes next. Uh, and I'm curious if if you've picked this up, what do you think about, about this? Uh, same for Undiscovered Country as well. And finally, for uh, this next book from Ahoy Comics, it's the five-issue, I believe, miniseries Dragonfly and Dragonfly Man. This is written by Tom Pyre. Uh, artist is Peter Krauss. Annie Troy is the colorist. Rob Steen is the letterer. Uh, this is a um, a continuation of these characters, but I it, it looks like a not, not not really a prequel, but it's definitely a uh, set before the wrong Earth time frame or storyline or what, however you want to you want to think about it, uh, which I quite enjoyed. That was that was quite an enjoyable miniseries from last year. And again, you get that dual nature story where you get uh, a page, basically a page each told from the Dragonfly Man uh, world, which is uh, an homage to the 66 Batman TV series. If, you, if you're familiar with that, um, it's, it's very evocative of, of that style. Uh, and then you get the Dragonfly part which is the alternate ver- alternate universe version, the the grim and grittier. Think of um, uh, late eighties, nineties uh, comics, um, especially you know Batman type stuff. However, this is so basically the the plot for both worlds uh, revolves around the adversary Devil Man, and he's. On the so so I forgot to mention uh, Earth Alpha is the Batman sixty six uh, 
analog, and then Earth Omega is the uh, the the '90s grim and gritty version of of Dragonfly. So Devil Man is coming up with in both worlds is coming up with ways to turn people evil. I mean, it's a very simple simple idea, but on Earth Alpha, it's a it's a it's a ray gun that turns people evil. In the other one, it appears to be a biochemical situation where people are bitten by these infected creatures. Um, I think it's uh, it's a wombat or a Tasmanian devil? Or is it just a big rat? I'm not sure. No, it's not a rat. (laughs) It's something much bigger. So with with Dragonfly, the Earth uh, Earth Omega version, um, the story opens with really told from the point of view of Stinger, which is his sidekick, his, his, his Robin. And, um, Things are not not great between them. Uh, Stinger feels unappreciated and and put down by his 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 mentor all the time. Where on Earth Alpha, the, the you know the the dynamic duo really are um, more of a partnership. There's a lot more respect and camaraderie there. There's a scene with uh, Dragonfly Man uh, fighting a kangaroo in a ring, which is funny. Uh, and then finally, towards the end of the book, both sets of characters are attacked. Dragonfly Man and Dragonfly are both infected, one by the one by the ray and one by the bite of one of those. I think, like I said, I think it's a Tasmanian devil. They both start. Uh, the The issue ends with them both starting to attack their proteges. So, uh, in the previous series, The Wrong Earth, Jamal Igel. Um, did the art on that, but Peter Krauss, um, whom I know from some stuff he did with Mark Wade, and I'm blanking on the name. Anyway, um, does a really fine job here, especially the different. Well, uh, you know, Krauss and Troy, uh, because the Earth uh, Earth Omega stuff is much darker, darker tones, lots of shadows. And the Earth Alpha stuff, very bright, um, very bright colors, um, drawn in a simpler, maybe, or maybe I'm just kind of putting that. No, I think so. I think I think uh, you could say that is simpler lines to evoke a simpler time, I guess, way. So I, I really appreciate that that difference in art uh, to do to depict the mm, the emotional raison d'etre of the of the book, I guess. So, and then uh, with all the Hoi comics, you get these, some prose stuff in here, some short stories, and then you get <laughs> the very last page is, uh, two images, uh, showing a scene from the story, uh, asking, can you spot the 12 differences? And of course I was sucked in, uh, in doing that. And I, I, I have to admit, I, there was one thing I couldn't find, so I had to look at the the uh, the answer at the bottom, you know, that's turned upside down, so you don't immediately uh, read it and know where these things are. <laughs> so, I remember just loving that kind of stuff when I was a kid. So, I, I appreciate that. This was a nice way to, or a nice um, return to these characters in this world. I really enjoyed the Wrong Earth, um, and this is, you know, a nice prequel type thing. I hope it. I don't know. I, I, I really like this aspect with uh, Stinger of Earth Omega and his relationship with his mentor, uh, Dragonfly. Uh, like it in the sense that I like how they're exploring this this wedge between them, or at least this perceived, these perceived slights. Uh, I'm, I'm half expecting that Dragonfly is treating his protege this way to protect him and you know maybe that's not the best approach but you know how batman is with his robins not always not not always the best leader is he and we're kind of seeing this with dragonfly and speaking of dragonfly you know i can i can i can i I could totally get you know dragonfly man it's batman it's so you know take bat and you put it with man you take dragonfly you put it with man that totally makes sense in the earth alpha world but why would someone who's who's grim and gritty and serious as Dragonfly, why would he call himself Dragonfly? Why not something more menacing, at least, you know, Yellow Jacket? I know that name's taken, but you get my point. It's like, that's a weird, 
<laughs> it's a weird dissonance that I'm not I'm not fully understanding yet. But uh, maybe we'll get an answer to that someday, maybe in this series. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed uh, this these brief overviews of these three new comics. Uh, let me know how you liked these three comics. And uh, you can do so by emailing me at longboxreview at gmail.com. Or you can uh, message me on Twitter at longboxreview. And if you enjoyed the show, uh, please please leave me a review. You can go to, this is new, you can go to ratethispodcast.com slash LBR for Longbox Review. And um, depending on uh, if you're if you're using a mobile device or you're, or you're using um, uh, some sort of PC, however you you are consuming this podcast, you can uh, leave a review at as I said, ratethispodcast.com slash lbr. I'd I'd really appreciate that. Uh, you can also subscribe, rate, and review the show via Apple Podcasts. I'm also on, according to some articles I'm reading. Uh, the show is available on the biggest podcast platform, which is Spotify, as well as others. Pretty much anywhere you, you uh, can consume podcasts, the Longbox Review podcast is there for you. But you already know that because you're listening right now. <laughs> but, you know, tell a friend. <laughs> I'd appreciate it. Anyway, thanks for listening, everybody. Bye-bye.